Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to be talking about startup files. Ooh, very exciting. So obviously if you've been watching my videos for a while, you'll notice that my file is quite different from the default Blender file. And basically I've been sharing my custom startup file on Gumroad for free for quite a long time now and I try and keep it updated, but I've been making lots of little adjustments and changes over time to kind of help with my own workflow. But I think more importantly with this video, I'm going to try and explain why things are laid out the way they are. And a lot of it's to do with negating frustration when using Blender. What I have on the screen here is a new piece of artwork I've done, but basically this is a a demonstration of what one of my files actually looks like once I've done with a piece of artwork. You can see we've got a couple of node windows going on here on the left. It's a very vertical layout this, but the 3D view kind of central and everything else on the right. You will notice there are only a few workspace tabs here at the top and you might also key into the fact that the theme is not regular for Blender. This is darker than the Blender dark theme. And that's because, spoiler, I have my own theme as well. So let's go to the original untouched version of the file, the thing that I see when I open Blender. So this is it, without changing anything, this is what my startup file looks like. Now the most obvious thing that I think people will recognize first is the shader editor on the left here. So if I bring my mouse up here to the top and drag this down, you can see we've got the geometry nodes editor here. Likewise, I can also go down here and drag this up to get the world nodes. Now I think some people might find this messy and a little bit odd, but the reason I have this is because I like having these all open at once, so I can make changes to, say, the volume of the scene while I'm experimenting with materials and then also click on the object and adjust the material there. So I like having these two open at the same time. So the reason it's laid out like this is because I always hated having to make new window spaces, then go to the drop down and choose the specific editor. In every single project I do, I always need the shader and world node. So why not just have them open already? Now for people that aren't used to Blender, this might be a bit messy because the extra rows of the user interface elements might be confusing, but it's not a problem for me because I've used it for so long. So this is how I like having my layout. So a question here might be well why vertical why not horizontal what I mean by that is why don't I have like the shader editor nodes going along the bottom here so if we go to object see that's another annoying thing like when you go into the shader editor is it going to be on world or is it going to be an object by default I don't know I hate having to go to a second drop down so that's why I have it open by default okay so the reason why it's vertical and not horizontal is because I did a lot of experimenting with this right and I found out it's so much less frustrating having the nodes vertically onto the side and the reason for it is quite obvious it's because node parameters stack vertically so it's very easy to move across nodes, even more useful with the node minimap add-on down here. I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with having a horizontal view like this, but I just found that for me, I prefer having it vertically on the side. Again, that's a complete personal preference. So putting that aside for now, let's go to something a bit more interesting in the 3D view, which is the lighting. So obviously I have a default lighting setup in my startup file. It's one that I stumbled on when working on Bygen version 9, and it was a lighting setup that I just thought looked good for like anything, like any scenario, any object. Let me get rid of the sphere and put like a Suzanne head in, kind of scale it down, apply that and give it my default material. Let's increase the brightness of that. So basically the reason I like is because it can just make any object look nice and presentable immediately. And it saves us from having to do like a custom setup every time. Just to give you a brief rundown of the lights in the scene, there are actually four lights here. So there's one white one coming in a bit further away and slightly more frontal at a power of 200. So these are all area lights as well. I just like how they diffuse across the surface. Coming up from the bottom, we have a more orangey color. So this is giving us this kind of side here. And then from the top, we have two colors. We've got a kind of light bluish, add a light purplish. If I wanted to go really crazy, I would probably put like an extra rim light in, you know, and have something strong coming off from the back, but I don't really need that. And another thing is we can select all of these lights. And if I go to the 3D cursor for the pivot, double tap R, we can rotate that around and, you know, get different interesting lighting setups like that. So using the same lights, we can get like a wide variety of cool visuals. So I like this being my default startup lighting setup, but it's a bit more complicated than that. And this is where we need to look into the world nodes. So the world nodes is going to require a little bit more explaining. Um, let me just show you the nodes here. I'll expand all of them to make it easier in case you wanted to kind of copy this. Okay, so there is an HDRI packed into the scene by default. It comes from Polyhaven. It used to be HDRI Haven. There were all the different Haven websites, you know, Texture Haven, Model Haven. It's all Polyhaven now, I believe, which is a repository of, you know, CC0 assets and stuff. So this is a CC0 HDRI, which is packed into the file. Now, I didn't know exactly kind of what HDRI I was going to use. So there's some extra nodes here for color and brightness and contrast control, which is actually quite interesting for getting like stylistic effects. Maybe I might be able to demonstrate that. But, you know, what's all this stuff over here? Okay, well, this background node controls controls the strength of the HDRI lighting. Now I'm going to have to turn off the density of the volume here to have a look at this properly. So if I increase this background node here, you can see that, oh, you know, it's way too bright. If I put it back down, we get the regular HDRI. Let me also increase the reflectivity. This might make it a bit more obvious. Okay, shades move. Okay, there we go. So we're now reflecting the HDRI. 
So again, turning up the brightness, we can see what happens, turning it down. Now, if we increase the contrast with this node, we're gonna get some harsher colors coming from the HDRI. And also by going to the mapping, we can change the rotation. So if I adjust the Z value, then it's gonna rotate the HDRI around the object. Maybe we can also do things like changing the hue value, which is just gonna shift all of the color from the HDRI to something else on the spectrum. So you can see that just with these basic nodes, we can have immediate color control and control over the variety of how the HDRI looks. Okay, that's fine, but what's all this confusing stuff here? You know, light path, all these gray, black and white nodes in the background, okay. Well, you might be wondering why we can't see the HDRI on the background and why it's only present on this object. And that is because of this light path node. What we're doing is we're mixing the HDRI with a regular color. So the regular color here is the black color, which is our background. And we're using the light path node. And in that we're using the Boolean value is camera ray. And essentially to keep it short, what this does is anything that the camera is not hitting is essentially just gonna be black. So that's why I have these preset RGB values here, which means I can quickly swap between white if I plug that in. So now we've got a white background, uh, gray if we need it and black again. And it's just like having nice, easy control to swap those around. Again, there is independent control for the strength of the color going into the background, but I just leave that on 10. Like anything higher than that is kind of like, you know, diminishing returns for brightness. White can only get so white. And then lastly, we have the principled volume. I love using volumes in my work, um, but you might wonder, okay, why is there a value node here? It's because quite often when I'm doing artwork, I like to enable and disable the volume for the sake of increasing performance when working on different aspects of the scene, but I can't always remember what value the density was. So that's why I have a value node, so I can just plug it in and unplug it when I need it. Okay, so that's a general rundown of why the world nodes are like this. This has hardly changed in like the last year or two. I can't remember how long I've had the startup file up for, but this has basically been everything I've ever needed. All right, so next up, let's talk about materials. So I have a few default materials in the scene that can be applied to objects. And yeah, essentially they're just like, you know, templates for nodes. So if you take a look at the material list here, there's free in here by default, PBR, matte cap, and emissive. PBR is exactly what you think, it's just a material with the principal BSDF shader already plugged in. This is assigned to the default object by default. So actually, let me reset the scene again and we can take a look at that. So here we go, if I go into rendered, click on it, it's got the PBR plugged in. So the other materials are emissive, it's just an emission shader because I use emissive stuff a lot in my work. So again, this just saves me a bit of time having to make a material, grab the emission node from the shift A menu and then plug it into the material output. And then lastly is matte cap. Now matte cap works pretty much the same way as, you know, in the solid view here, if we go over to the matte cap in the viewport shading and say if I take the lines, for example, you see how it kind of, you know, stays projected along an object like that. The reason why there's some distortion is because this is actually a subdivided cube, not a sphere. If I made it a sphere quickly, then you'll see the projection is stable, apart from the pinching at the top. But for the rendered view, the matte cap basically allows us to take an image. So it would usually be a matte cap image, which is a square image with a circle running through it. And inside of that circle is basically a texture, which is going to be projected as the surface. So for example, if I grab the HDRI I'm using, then you can see that being projected on the object here. Now it's okay, it's interesting for like doing stylized effects and all sorts of other stuff, but this projection method is not perfect because as it moves away from the camera, there's a bit of distortion in how it's laid out. I know that other people have alternatives for the mapping method, but yeah, I just thought it's an interesting one to keep around in the file. I don't use it much, but I just wanted to keep hold of it. I did also used to have a transparent material, but I don't need that anymore because I basically just use the principal shader, especially with the alpha value here. So a template transparent material isn't really needed for me anymore. All right, so next up, let's talk about the workspace tabs up here. I only have three tabs up here, and why do I have three? It's because no one ever uses workspace tabs. <laughs> okay, that's a generalization. I'm sure lots of people use them, but I just always usually do my work in one workspace like this. If I needed anything else like the shader editor, I would just, you know, make a new window and go ahead and grab it. The thing is, there are some instances where I actually feel like I do need a different tab, and that's for the compositor here. This is an example. Because when I'm done rendering something in the 3D view, I think, oh, I can't be bothered to like open up a compositor. And also like the image editor so I can have a look at the render result. I can't be bothered with that. So the compositor tab is where I come and quickly to do the little changes to the final image. And there's not a lot in here. There's just like a couple of basic node groups, and these basically have all the nodes I'll need to, to kind of get the effects I want. I don't usually do much compositing, which is why there's just like one node group here here for doing bloom type stuff and one node group here which has got all of our color correction type stuff. So that's pretty self-explanatory. So the last tab up here is scripting. So if we come over here, this one's a bit different. Obviously I do add-on development work and sometimes I need to do a few experiments with the Blender API. So down here we have the interactive Python console for Blender, then we have the text editor window here, and then just a 3D view where we can kind of select objects and play around with them. But you notice that here there's already text in the text editor window and that's because I have one text file which I keep packed in Blender, which is the resolution and frame rate reference. 
So I keep this here because sometimes I forget like certain resolutions and aspect ratios and what they are, or I can't be bothered to calculate things. So here you go again, pretty self-explanatory. We can just see like different screen sizes, how many frames per minute there are for a certain frame rate and stuff like that. So I just find that quite useful. Okay, so now let's take a look at the outliner up here. So where we have the collections, there are four collections by default in my file, cameras, lights, control, and objects. Again, quite self-explanatory. Cameras are where cameras go, lights are where lights go, objects are where objects go. And this is the one that's selected by default. So when we make anything new, it goes into the objects collection. But the last one is control. And this is where we have the world origin object. So the world origin object is basically to help with mirror modifiers. So if I make a cube here, go to the modifiers, add a mirror. And let's say I wanted to mirror itself over the kind of center point of the world here. Well, then I'd go to mirror object and then choose world origin. And there we go. So that's what the world origin's for, like it's a control point object. You'll also notice it's been marked to be non-selectable, which means we can't accidentally click it if we have objects there in the way. So going back over here, you'll notice that there are some different visibility toggles. So the essential ones that have active are the selectable toggle, the disabling viewports, and the disabling renders. I don't actually usually have the hide in viewport active because that doesn't really matter to me too much. So basically just to clarify there, the disabling viewport shows and hides it in the viewport even if you're rendering there. But the hide toggle is for if you press H on an object to hide it. And you see that's disabled there, but you can press Alt H to bring it back. Again, I don't usually use that too much, so I don't always have that on my list. But these are the essential ones for me. Having the selectable toggle so I don't accidentally select something when I'm working on artwork, disabling it in the viewport so I can hide it when it's not needed, and disabling it in the render as well. Okay, so now the default object. What happened to the default cube? No. Well, here's the thing. It is the default cube. You can see here it says cube, but he's just had a bit of a facelift. So he's got a subdivision surface modifier applied already. And the main reason for that is for testing. What I mean is when I was working on the Biogen add-on, so let me go to the official surface effects and apply the modifier here. Like a subdivided cube is not a perfect sphere, but what it does give us is a nice distribution of faces, which is good for testing stuff like applying with weight paint, where you can get like a nice kind of vertex density going around the object. So that's why I like using a subdivided cube. It's also a good starting point when doing stuff like, you know, hard surface work. So if I reset that again, come under here, you know, like I, I tend to start with subdivided objects quite a lot when doing work. So, you know, you can just get working and start modeling and stuff right away. So, okay, what else is there? If we take a look at the camera, the focal length is set to 90 by default. I like having quite high focal lengths when doing artwork. I just feel like it looks better for like, you know, composition standpoints. Of course, it really depends on the scene you're making. For things which are more like diorama scenes. So if I go back to the artwork I was working on recently, you can see here, this is quite a high focal length piece because again, it's like, it's a flattened piece of artwork with different elements composed in front of each other. If we were doing a more environmental scene, then it would be a much smaller focal length because just of a demonstration, we want to see more of the scene in one go. So again, setting that back up to 90 at a place like this, it doesn't really make much sense. But as I say, I generally prefer high focal lengths for art pieces. And this kind of also ties into like taking selfies in real life. You may or may not have noticed that like front facing cameras don't look as good when taking selfies as back facing ones. It's because there's a focal length difference. Faces tend to look better at high focal lengths because they're not kind of like distorted and construed. Actually, let me see if I can give a weird demonstration here in the solid view. So look, a really low focal length looks weird, but a higher focal length looks a lot more sensible. But anyway, look, the same kind of note applies when I'm making artwork right now. My focal length for the viewport is 80. So I like moving to 80 when I've kind of done a lot of the modeling work and I'm starting to work more on the rendering side of things like materials and stuff. But if we go back to the original startup file, you'll notice it's on 50 because this is the block out phase. I start off with a lower focal length while I'm, you know, kind of like just laying out the scene and making stuff and modeling and all of that. All right, is there anything else? Maybe uh, render settings. So if you take a look down here, my samples, my max samples are set to 300 for renders. I use cycles by default because it's the engine I use the most nowadays. You know, you could have it on Eevee as well. That's perfectly fine. If you take a look at Eevee, I have like bloom and ambient occlusion enabled by default and screen space reflections down to the other render settings. So 2000 by 2000 pixels is my default. 30 frames a second. And my output is set to PNG RGB, although I should probably put that to RGBA, but you know, you could choose anything else. You might find OpenEXR more useful, but I just like using PNG when doing my regular artwork. See, I think that's about it. So maybe you might take some of these things into consideration when designing your own startup file. Everyone's workflows are different. And that's one of the beautiful things about Blender. I love how customizable it is. Anyone can like design their file however they like to help with their own workflows. If you really like mine, like I said, you can download it for free using the link in the description on Gumroad. Just enter zero in the price field. 
And yeah, well, hopefully you found this interesting. I know that talking about startup files might be a bit more boring than some other projects, but this is just something I thought might be useful to some people. Let me know if you want to see a breakdown of this artwork as well, because there are some interesting techniques I learned about while doing this. Anyway, feel free to like, subscribe, do all that other stuff if you feel like it. Maybe support me on Patreon, check out my products on curtisholder.online forward slash store. Maybe check out my Biogen add-on for generative modeling and artwork in Blender, and especially the new generators lab content pack. I've got a video out about that on my channel. So if you've made it to the end, the emoji for this video is going to be a clapperboard. So put that in the comments so I can see if you've made it this far. And it's a clapperboard because with startup files we're signaling action, the start of making Blender projects. So thanks for watching everyone, have a fantastic day and I will see you next time.